Hi everybody, welcome to the 15 minute rap with Ezekiel's wheel. I'm Dr. Missy Hood. Hope everybody's doing well, guys. Get started here in a few minutes. Welcome everybody. Hope you're having a great week this week. I want to welcome everybody to Ezekiel's Will today. I hope everybody's doing good this week. It's kind of one of those hazy, daisy days. Um, we're right the week before Thanksgiving. I want to wish you all a happy holiday season. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, it's just been one of those weeks, really. I think everybody's just kind of getting in the holiday groove of things. And I think there are several things going on right now. If you noticed, um, and I apologize for this, we did not repost the replay for Monday's 15-Minute Rev. And it's because we taught on, or I, I taught on some things that I didn't feel like were really, really appropriate to be sharing with the public. And so please forgive us if you didn't get that replay. We'll make up for it next week and you'll definitely get your 15 minute rev. And so I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm Dr. Missy Hood with the 15 minute rev here at Ezekiel's Wheel. And we do these on Mondays and Fridays every week. We rev you up for the week and then we rev you back up for the weekend getting you ready to go into God's house as we move you forward. And so I've got a really cool word today. And, you know, sometimes I feel like God just kind of repeats himself. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I, I think you'll get the gist of it as we move into the word today. And so let's pray and get you on your way. And we'll see what God has to say. <laughs> and I didn't mean to repeat or to rhyme. So <laughs> that's funny. I wish I could pull your comments up on here. You can't, I can't see the comments on Facebook. Um, because of the way that it's geared here on StreamYards. And so, you know, I'll read them later, but post, post, post away and I'll contact you later and we can talk about stuff. So, well, Father, I do thank you for what you're doing here today. I thank you for who you are and I thank you for what you do. And I thank you for this team. I thank you for the love that we share, Father God. And I thank you for the way that you've evolved this team into such a loving team. And, and Lord, I thank you for all, even the Facebook listeners, Father God, and just the loving crowd that I have out there. And so, Father, we just ask you to be with us today. Use my mind, will, and emotions, Father God. Pull all the tools out of my backpack that you choose to use. And I just, I'm grateful that you show up. And it's in your precious son's name I pray. Amen. So, what are we dealing with? What are we dealing with? Gosh, you know what I think what we're dealing with right now? I think that a lot of what the body's going through right now is that they're kind of stressed out about, the situation of the nation for one over the holiday season they're stressed out about not getting they feel like they're not getting their prayers answered but what they don't understand is that there's this tug of war going on in the spirit right now um with god's people battling the occult and we're pressing to turn this ship around so we're battling the occult to turn this ship around and so a lot of these uh, a lot of Christians are, are really discouraged. I think that they're misreading the circumstances um, and what's going on around them. They're believing what they see with their eyes instead of what the Lord's telling them by the spirit. And this is why the Lord said to believe the prophets. You always want to believe the prophets because the prophets are the mouthpiece of the Lord. They're the mouthpiece of Jesus. If they're true prophets, if their words don't fall to the ground. And so there's a difference. I want to stipulate the difference. It's one thing, and I'm going to get into it in the word as we go forward, but it's one thing to be able to decree a thing with your mouth the word of god because the word of god is a living oracle okay it's it's an oracle that's alive and active it's sharper than any two-edged sword it goes out and accomplishes that which it seeks to accomplish however when god lays his spirit or his anointing on your flesh on your vessel to where even your words come to pass you're only speaking what you hear your father saying not your own evil desires not your own dysfunct debunk you're only saying and speaking what you hear your father say, he'll back your words. And that's when you're a true prophet because your words won't fall to the ground. They're alive and active at that point. They're going out and accomplishing that which God seeks for them to accomplish. And so praise God on that. And so that's that's the season we're living in right now. We're learning about false teachers, false preachers, false prophets. We're learning about Balaam's prophets. We're learning about false prophet apostles. And I never honestly dreamed that I'd ever live to see a day like this, to be honest with you. But this is the day we're living in. This is the day we have to become acclimated to and, and knowledgeable about. And so here we are. But the teaching today is interesting. This is a really, really interesting teacher, or interesting teaching because it's it's things that my own father would tell me. 
as a kid growing up. And it's based on Ezekiel 44, 1 through Ezekiel 45, 12. And it's based on when we forget whose house we're in. Have you ever gone to somebody else's house and you kick your feet up? Say you went to a friend's house and after school or whatever, when you were in school and you made yourself at home and you didn't understand the rules of that house. And all of a sudden, one of the parents of your friends came in and they're like, hey, get your feet off my coffee table. Don't make yourself at home here. There are rules to this house. And I expect you to abide by the rules of the house. Did you ever have your parents tell you that? Uh, ever have your parents tell you, you know, when you get your own house and you can make the rules of your own house? However, if you're abiding with the Lord, there are different rules that you're going to carry with you into your house for your own family, hopefully, so that you you and your house can be built by the Lord. Only the Lord builds a house and all those that build, there's a lone labor in vain. So this is going to be an interesting conversation today. As the Lord's talking about his sanctuary, when we forget whose house it is. And it's because the Lord has a very, very specific way that he does things. And he has a very, very specific thing that the way that he, uh, what do you say, de decorates his house and the way that he has things ordered in his house, in your house, in your vessel, in order for you to get to know a holy God so that he can visit your house. You want him to visit your house, right? You want to call him friend. You want to say, Lord, you know, you're welcome as guest at my house, at my table. You have keys to my house. I want to give you keys to my house. Here, here's a key. Make yourself at home. Kick back. Flip on the TV. I'd say grab something out of the fridge. Grab grab some water. Grab whatever you choose, Lord. You made, you made wine. You turned water into wine. You drink one of drink of beer. Fine. Grab one. I doubt that he would, but I don't know. I'm not God. But make yourself at home. This is my home. And mi casa es su casa. That's what he's wanting you to say. So, you know, but there's a way, you know, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> in order for my friends to be a part of my life or for me to be a part of their life, and the same is true with the Lord. We have to understand that there are certain criteria that are deal breakers in that relationship that'll hinder them from coming around, right? They won't, if you mistreat your friends or if you act one way on the, on the, in front of other people with that friend, and then you act like crap behind the scenes towards that person, they're not going to want to hang out with you in a social setting, right? They're not going to, because you're not the same in front and behind. You're not the same yesterday, today, and forever like God is. You're, you're, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent in everything that he does. And so when we forget that there are standards for having and maintaining that relationship or relationships on the whole, we've kind of made ourselves at home to God's house to where he can't dwell there very much, which is kind of interesting, actually. So let's move into Ezekiel, where he's talking about this. He's talking about the regulations in his house. And he said, we're going to move to Ezekiel 44, 5. And he says, son of man, take careful notice. Use your eyes and ears and be li and listen to everything I tell you about the regulations concerning my temple. Take careful note of the procedures for using the temple's entrances and exits. He's got a specific thing he wants them to do. He's telling him right here. And, and give these rebels, the people of Israel, and he's already not, he's made a mental notation. I see you for who you are. And, and the people give these rebels, the people of Israel, he labeled them, the, this message from the sovereign Lord. Oh, people of Israel, enough of your detestable sins. You've brought uncircumcised foreigners into my sanctuary, into my house. I did not give you permission to do this. People who have no heart for me. So there's a certain way that we come before a holy God and the first way is being willing to get free. And we see so many people in the house of God right now are people that show up unannounced. Don't you hate when people show up at your house unannounced? And they surprise you and you have no makeup on and you're like, oh, forgive my appearance. And, and, you know, and people that just show up any old way and then they make themselves at home and they start cluttering up your your living room and they start making themselves at home to your refrigerator and then they decide they're going to stay a few days and yet they don't want to conform to the rules of the house. They have no intention on conforming to the rules of your house. And God's like, Hey slick. I believe this is what he says. Hey slick. Get your feet off my coffee table. And by the way, why don't you straighten up 
and quit slouching all over and laying all over my couch. Sit up, make room for other people beside you. There's a standard that he's starting to put in place. The, the way the actual vocabulary might go in the church is that God's saying, hey, hey, slick. You know, your heart's not really that great. You come into my house and I, I observe you treat the leaders with regard in some sense. If some of you don't, some of you could care less. And then you go behind closed doors and you act like hell. And, and then you think, I don't notice because I'm on mission and I see everything. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the end of the beginning. I'm everywhere. The devil can only be at one place at one time. And so God's like, you can't come into my house and think I'm going to come in with you and allow the visitation to take place without you cleaning your act up a little bit. This is an interesting conversation today, actually. And so there are so many things going on here there's so many parts of this conversation so if you refuse to allow god to clean up your heart in this hour basically he's not going to visit your house he's not going to be coming near your dwelling matter of fact he's going to pull away from you and he's going to go find a vessel that will let him do that that's i'm just shooting straight up i'm just shooting straight up because god is a god that can't dwell where sin is and so he's got to have a vessel that wants to get cleaned up in order to have a visitation there. And so we should always, I hear you, Lord. We should always be willing to change or be changed. And it doesn't mean, you know, this is interesting too. I'm noticing this in some of my other relationships, even within family, is that we have some people because they got stuck in doctrines of demons and traditions of man, and they've done things a certain way for like the last 30 or 40 years of their life. And they think that's the way it's always going to be. So when change comes knocking at their door, they have a hard time with it. And if anybody is a mouthpiece for that change and they're the bad guy, they're labeled the bad guy and, and you're just not religious like us. And therefore you can't be of God. That means God doesn't know you. Therefore, I don't have to know you. I don't have to relate with you. Yeah. You're the first person they run to when all hell breaks loose against their life. That's kind of insulting. That's how they do God, you know? That's how they do God. They're like, that's what they do at God's house. God's not at their house. He's not in their temple. He's not at their church house because it's got Ichabod on their door. And it's obvious by, because everybody there, even leadership acts like hell. And then they treat everybody else like hell. And then they wonder why nobody must come to their church because God's not there. And then they ask for signs, wonders, and miracles to show up. And it's like, well, if you get out, if you get your butt out of, the, out of the way, then God would show up and he'd set all of you free, but you won't get out of the way because you're so determined to have it your own way that there's no room for God. There's no room for God. And so long story short, we've got to be willing to be changed in our encounters with God in order to have him show up so we can have a relationship with a holy God. We've got to be willing to do these things. And so this is an hour right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Where many are allowing a lot of things to stand in their way. I'm going to, I'm going to preface this conversation here too with this with these things that are standing in our way in this season right here right now where I think it's hindering a lot of the body and we know better. We know better. We're seasoned warriors. We know better. But there are so many things that we're allowing to get in our way of allowing us to plow through all the garbage in our hearts, minds, wills and emotions. Because we just think it should have been changed by now. It should have been different by now. And my life should have been evolved by now. And, and I want my life back. And, and God, it's just not like I thought it was going to be. And I didn't sign up for this. And God's like, I didn't sign up for dying on a cross, but it happened to me. And I did it willingly. And so the place that we're in right now is the place where people are allowing, I'm just going to, this is the here and the now, then we're going to go back to the word, but people are allowing the holidays to keep them so upset about so many things right now. This is, I'm prefacing this with this. And people are involved and they're, they're caught up in situations from about the past. They're caught up in dreading dealing with family or people that don't want to change or be changed yet. They haven't chosen to change so they can love them through it. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm above that. Some people are just hard to love. And, especially narcissistic people. They're hard to love and God loved them. I love them. Lord, you love them. I love them because you first loved me, but you know, 
Some people are just hard to love. And then they're caught up in past hurts. And then they're all caught up in the fear of their future and not being even sure of it because of the times that we live in right now. And so there's a lot of things going on around us right now that we're having to wrap our heads around, I think, in order to even stay in step with God and with God's prophets. And the one thing I'm going to tell you just out of love, I guess, and out of, out of friendship for you is that the one thing I trust, the one thing I know that I know, and the one thing I had to get over was me when it came to the word, when it came to the future and walking in prophecy, walking in the prophetic word, because I know that God doesn't lie for one. And the Lord says, my spirit will bear witness with the spirit of God in you. The spirit bears witness with the spirit. So if I'm connected to the right truth source and I'm seeing the Lord show up every Sunday in that truth source in that, that say I'm listening. I'll t well, I tell you who I listen to. I listen to Dr. Chuck Pierce. I listen to several people. I listen to Ron Carpenter. I listen to Dr. Marsharona. I listen to Michael shoot Michael Pitts. There it is. Patricia King, Doug Addison, just to name a few. Those are the few people I listen to several others too. Um, but several prophets, I track the prophets, obviously. And so when I'm tracking the prophets, I'll listen to Kenneth Copeland, um, John Kilpatrick, but I track the prophets and I believe the truth source. I believe what the Lord is saying through these prophets. Now, if you listen to the prophets, you'll be blessed. I know that. Okay. And I know that if I'm listening to the truth source and then I'm having to come back into my own arena after listening to those truth sources, and I'm still dealing with these issues like I just told you that I feel like you're dealing with and that I'm dealing with and that we're all dealing with around the holidays. Then one thing is for certain. One of these things is for certain. Either I'm going to believe in what I feel about these situations and I'm going to let my feelings dominate me and dominate my spiritual truths that I just came out of. Or I'm going to allow my spirit man to linger with the spirit of God, to linger with in the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, not the truth about what I see, the truth about what I don't see. I'm going to connect my heart to that instead of this. So if I'm connected to God's truth instead of my flesh truth, that's a good way to say that, then I'm able to stand in the truth and follow the truth and let it bulldoze its way through my circumstances. And I hope that makes sense. Because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the one thing I know about the truth, the way, the truth, and the life is that he does not lie. And if you know anything about the processes of intercession, you know that it's an unfolding process. And I'm going to go over today, by the way. I'm going to be here for about an hour. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope it's good. But um, it's, it's, it's the truth, though. It, it's the truth. It's an unfolding process. When you learn how to intercede, when you pray your way through something, when you decree your way through something, when you're about your father's business and you're following the prophets, the prophets are telling you every season what to decree. They're telling you decree a thing and it'll come to pass. Well, there's, there's certain words for every season and the devil's got his false prophets saying things. That means people in the occult, people that don't even, they're tares. They don't even know they're part of the occult, but they're being used by the devil and they're prophesying the enemy's plans. And then God's true prophets are prophesying his plans. So you're to be prophesying God's plan. So your bulldozer can push its way through. That encourages me, by the way. That, that it, and, and we can be sure of that one thing, that God's plans are successful. They don't ever fail. God says, I finish what I start. The enemy is subject to being overthrown, which he always is from faith to faith and glory to, to glory from season to season because God's on a timetable and God's ways are going to happen. So let's get back to the story. So that we, we've set the regulation in place. You, you come into God's house. He's got his HDTV up on the screen and you decided to make yourself at home. And he said, get your feet off my coffee table. So, and then he's saying, and, and what are you a foreigner in my house doing here? I didn't invite you in. If you want to, if you want to be changed, if you want to evolve into my image and if, if, if I recognize you as one of my own, then you're welcome in my house. But if I don't recognize you, then chances are you're a tear in my house and you're just a wannabe. You're just somebody that gives lip service to who you think I am, to what you think I do, to what you think love looks like, feels like, sees like, but you're not. 
And, and it's, and it's, it's a waste of time because God's like, I don't have time for that. I want people who are going to be conformed to my image. So we're based on Ezekiel 44, nine. And it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. No foreigners, including those who live among the people of Israel will enter into my sanctuary, even if they've not been circumcised and have not surrendered themselves to the Lord and men of the tribe of Levi who abandoned me with Levi with a Levitical priest who abandoned me when Israel strayed from me to worship idols must bear the consequences of their unfaithfulness. Meaning, and I got that right away. It was usually means that when, when we're not faithful to God, when we're disloyal to God, when we commit adultery on God, it kind of takes him a little bit to get his trust levels back up and thinking, well, are you going to be tossed to and fro? Are you double-minded? Are you just, are you going to flee after everything that has a, I'm just going to be blunt. Let's, we're having an adult conversation, but are you going to chase after every skirt that goes by you? Are you going to chase? Cause your, your idolization can be sex. Your idolization can be drugs. Your idolization can be drink, spending, overspending, overworking, mark your idol, mark your idol. So are you going to chase after everything that flies by you, that distracts you every time things don't go your way? Every time your heart gets upset, every time a holiday season comes around, here we go, Lord. Thank you. Let's jump on this roller coaster together. Let it go fast. Let it go fast. <laughs> Have you ever ridden a roller coaster before? Have you ever ridden the roller coaster? Um, there's a roller coaster at Astro World, actually, and I don't know if we still have it, but it's got G-Force. And my best friend, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm going to tell you this. My best friend got me on it. And I don't like heights, by the way. I struggle with heights. I went to the top of the Empire State Building and almost got sick. I've been there twice or three times, actually, three times. And I still I stay with my edge because I have a terrible fear of heights. But on this G-Force roller coaster, my best friend got me on. She's like, yeah, yeah, Melissa, let's go. And I'm like, God, what do I let you do to me? So I get on this thing and I realize I'm locked in. I can't get off. So we start going up the hill and it's like 12 stories high on this hill. And as we start, like it starts like ching, 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 like the cars start ching, 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 ching as they're trying to go higher. And I'm, I'm starting to have kind of an anxiety attack because I'm like, God, please help me, help me, help me. Cause I know it's fixing to start making me probably sick. And my best friend who's with me, she's like, this is going to be great. This is going to be Oh my God, I didn't, I didn't realize it was this high. And I was like, and I was like, you need to buckle up, Chuck. I go, because this is, we don't have any way off this thing now. The only way out is through. And so we're at the top and I'm looking down about to up Chuck. And all of a sudden it's in G force and it's flying. I mean, it's going. And I'm just, all you can do, you can feel your face getting sucked back like this because it's so fast. I'm not exaggerating. And so we get off the thing and everybody, you think that everybody would be, yeah, that was great. That was so great. Ah. Nobody said a word. Everybody was like, oh, no. And my best friend's like, that was really, I need to go lay down. No, get your butt up, man. We're going to ride rides. We're here for the enduring of the, we're here for the endearment. We're going to ride rides. You got me on that thing. And now you're going to ride some rides that I want to drive. Like those old timey cars. I want to go drive those old timey cars that are earthbound. I don't want to be flying around on tracks everywhere. I don't like stuff like that. So that's what it feels like. When you're learning to walk out a thing with the Lord, it's like woo, around the corner and you don't know. Woo, we're gonna be, oh, we're gonna go, oh. That's what you feel like in the kingdom because you don't know which way God's going to turn next, but he knows. He knows his prophets know. And so that's part of what you're going through right now. You're learning to get acclimated to God's house. And you learn to get your feet off his coffee table and you're learning to straighten up and pick up after yourself. And you're learning to, clean up your own clothes and clean up your bathroom. You're learning to clean up after yourself. And then you're as a good parent, cause he's a good parent. He comes in. He's like, you know, you want me to help you? I'm going to help you do your laundry today. Let's clean up your dirty laundry. Come on, come on in here, baby. Come on in here. Let's clean. I'm going to teach you how to separate the colors from the whites. I'm going to teach you how to separate them all. We're going to wash them right. We're going to get you. Then we're going to hang all your, laundry out to dry.
but nobody's going to see it because it's only going to be in your backyard. So nobody can come into your backyard unless God invites them there. And God knows I have no business being in anybody else's backyard because I don't need to see their crap. I don't need to see their crap and I don't need to be pointing out someone else's sin in their backyard. Neither do you. So that we're learning to keep our noses in our own backyards because we're in God's house, right? And that's how God does things. That's an amazing conversation. I never had any idea it was going to go this way. So here we go. Let's go on the rest of this roller coaster ride. So God's talking about the Levitical priest, and he's talking about Ezekiel 44, 16, 45, 16 now, 44, 16, excuse me. He says, they alone will enter my sanctuary and approach my table to serve me. They'll fulfill all my requirements. To me, that sounds like he's got a requirement in order for us to even come in. We've already talked about that. But there are certain things that we're required to do and that we're not allowed to do if we're going to dwell in God's house, if we're going to call ourselves his. Because, you know, when I run across people, and I'm sure they thought this about me in my younger years when I was a heathen, I'm sure I was a heathen and a half. It's, when, you run around, when you run across people that give a bad impression of love, you kind of think to yourself, you know, you could be, you give Jesus a bad name, man. You just give Jesus a bad name. And don't get me wrong. I don't think he expects perfection from us. Matter of fact, I know that he doesn't. I think he loves his flaws and all. But I do think he expects us to course correct when he gives us instruction to do it. I really, really do. I don't think he expects us to stay where it's comfortable, to stay in where it's convenient for us because the world's doing it or because my friends are doing it or Joe Blow's doing it. Or because my family might not approve if I go this direction with the Lord. How many of you have been kicked out of your family because your walks with the Lord? I know it doesn't feel too pleasant in my life right now, but I'm not crying in my beer about it. I've walked on. I went to a different pasture. I'm praying for him. You're listening. God love you. So, okay. So there's a requirement for us to maintain God's presence. And there's a requirement for us to stay in his house. And he says, they must leave them. They're talking about your clothing. This is interesting, by the way. I think this is very interesting. Pardon me. They must leave their clothes in the sacred rooms and put on other clothes so they do not endanger anyone by transmitting holiness to them through this clothing. Isn't that interesting? They must neither shave their heads. He's talking about the anointing, by the way. Um, they must neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow too long, trim their beards regularly. So the priest, if you're a leader, we're getting into leadership now. Amazing. The priest must not drink wine, must not drink wine before entering the inner courtyard. So they can drink wine. That's what that's saying. But you just can't do it and then go into God's house. How many people show up in God's house drunk? How many people show up in God's house high? How many people show up in God's house any way they want to think it's going to be acceptable? That's a mockery of God. So he's saying, get your house in order before you come into my house. Get yourself in order. And they may choose their wives only from among the virgins of Israel on the, or the widows of the priest. They may not marry other widows of divorced women or divorced women. They may not marry other widows or divorced women. They'll teach my people the difference between what's holy and what's common and what's ceremonially clean and unclean. So basically what God's saying here is love has a strict standard. It's a strict standard. And this is what people are afraid of in the world. If you're going to walk with God and you're going to call yourself God's child, if you're going to call yourself, he's my father, I'm his friend, he's my friend, then there are certain things that I have to adhere to or it's a deal breaker. It's a deal breaker, meaning God will love me. He'll love me, but I'll only go so far in kingdom and I won't inherit kingdom. What's that? Kingdom is destiny. Kingdom is destiny. So I'll be his child, but I'll still be hung out here in the outer courts. There's the outer court, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies. My goal is the Holy of Holies, which is AKA destiny, kingdom, so that I can walk out kingdom purposes, the signs, wonders, and the miracles, meaning that God's spirit has hovered and brooded over my house, looking for a place to, drip, to rest, looking to see if I'm dressed correctly in him to so see if he recognizes himself in me. So this isn't Burger King and I don't get it my way. That's what he's basically trying to say. And so if you do adhere to his ways and if you do things his way, what he's saying is that 
will actually also serve as judges in the courts of God to resolve disagreements among his people. The enemy goes to and fro. He runs to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And he runs in and out of the courtrooms of God. We're learning about the courtrooms of God right now via Robert Henderson. That's a big word for the hour. So we're going to be we're going to be serving as judges. That's what he's saying. Isaiah 126. If you haven't read that, that you're a judge in the court of God, the more mature you get and become in the courts through the anointing there. So the decisions must be based on my regulations and the priests themselves must obey my instructions and decrees and all the sacred festivals and see to it that the Sabbaths are set apart as holy days. So you're maintaining God's ways. You're maintaining his days. You're maintaining his standards and you're fulfilling his requirements in order for him to utilize you in his house. See how this plays in the, it's, it's all in order. It's all coming into succinction into where we're at right now. But the part, thank you, Holy Spirit. So I'm going to get up. I've got my notes. I've never taken this many notes before. Um, the part of the body that's acting maimed right now that refuses to come into God's house are also suffering from a spirit of religion, their own bloodline cursings, or their own personal hurt that they refuse to get healed of. They refuse to move on. And they're usually those struggling to come into maturity in Christ or the things that mean the most to them around them aren't changing because they've refused to change and allow God to do a thorough house cleaning like he's demanding. He wants them to get rid of their idols or their personal sin so that he can circumcise their hearts. So instead, they act like dry drunks. Have you ever had an encounter with a dry drunk or somebody who's gone to AA and I love AA people. I want you to know that, but people I've, I've never had an encounter with a dry drunk until about 20 years ago. And a dry drunk is somebody who refuses to get set, who refuses to get set free of the hurts that caused them to drink to begin with. So they continue perpetuating those hurts on other people. They can turn, continue to hurt people. And, and let me tell you, the one thing that'll set me off, and, and, and I got accused of this. People in church, when I first came to the church, it was a very, very religious church that I used to go to. These guys tell me, you're an angry person. You're an angry person. No, I'm not angry. I don't buy your brand of love. And I was always, I was, because they were always doing things. To, I'd see them sting one another and wound one another. And I'd be thinking, I don't want you near me. And I was very quiet and very standoffish that I always held them at bay. And, and because my family went to this church. And so I thought all the people there were just crazy trained. And I still do. Not all of them. There are a lot of good people. Well, probably, hopefully, hopefully they go there now. But I, they acted like dry drunks. They acted like dry drunks because they refused to get free from the things that so easily beset them. And then a lot of them were driven by religion, Jezebel, Ahab, which is a very abusive spirit. So they give these plastic illusions that, hi, how you doing? Praise God. And I'm thinking, I can't relate with you because you're too plastic for me. I just want someone who's down to earth and who's got problems like I do. And who wants to pray with me about it? I just want authenticity. That's what we always talk about. And so they're lacking. They were lacking the warm, unconditional love of Christ. A love that sets firm boundaries about right and wrong. And it pulls them out of the gray areas because love has rid their life of themselves, of their past, of all these things that so easily beset them. Therefore, they have nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to hide. Intimacy, true intimacy means into me. See, look into me, look into me. I know I've got flaws. I know I've got cracks. I know I've got, I know I make mistakes, but you know what? When you love with the warm love of Jesus, Love is blind. It becomes blind when you become fully aware, fully mature in love. It quits keeping account of all these things that religion makes you keep account of. Religion makes you keep account of all the rules. Did you line up with this rule? Did you line up with that rule? Oh, no, you missed that one. You could drive yourself crazy doing that. I have a member of my family who does that. She drives herself crazy. She is crazy. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, I'll leave that like it is. So if you don't keep track of family sin. You don't have a past. You're just redeemed to serve God at a greater capacity. That's what you do. You serve God at greater capacities and you don't 
get stuck there in all these disbunk, debunk rules of perfectionism and all this stuff that make people feel so ashamed and inadequate. You're just like, you know what? I love you flaws and all. And okay, you're screwed up. I'm screwed up and we'll get healed together. There you go. There you go. So that's where God's trying to get us in this hour. That's what he's moving us over into. He's telling us the requirements of his house. He's telling us what it takes to abide there. And so the Lord's saying, if you want the anointing on your vessel, then you got to do the things God has called you to do in order to have it. And we need to quit acting like we're wannabes, trying to convince our peers that we're something that we're not. Because God sees how we behave behind the scenes or behind closed doors. Lord says, no deliverance, no anointing. And those of you, this is, I'm not being critical. This is what he told me today. Those of you who have convinced yourselves that you're anointed because you know how to decree and pray the word of God. Think again, because the word of God is a live oracle. Okay. It's alive. It goes out and accomplishes that which it seeks to accomplish and it never returns back void. So it always works. However, without the anointing, without the presence of God on your vessel, without getting your heart right, without cleaning yourself up, your words don't do squat. They don't. They fall to the ground because God is not obligated to back anyone's words, but his own, unless the vessel is pure hearted so he can flow through it. Shazam, Tarzan. Oh, my Lord. And we have so many people in this hour. Those are false prophets, by the way. These are people that have convinced themselves that they're OK. Yet they refuse to look inward and they refuse to clean up the evil in their own hearts and acknowledge to themselves that they've got kind of a dark heart. They've got an evil heart. They need to clean it up. Let God clean it up. So he's saying, so if you're not willing to get free, don't expect the anointing. That's what he's saying. So we're moving forward, moving on into 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12. But let me move into the leaders in this hour. Before I go into 1 Peter 1 through 12, we're peaking at about 37 minutes. I told you I'd probably go to about an hour today. But there are even, it's not, this isn't just for the sheep, by the way. This message just isn't for the sheep. This is for leaders in this hour who want to build their own house by a different measure other than the ways that God builds a house. And if you go and read the book of Ezekiel 45, it talks about, the, the different weights, the honest weights and the scales and the honest measures, both dry and liquid, the homer will be your standard unit, the measuring volume, the ephah and the bath will each measure one tenth of a homer. The standard humor, excuse me, the standard unit for weight will be the silver shekel. One shekel will consist of 20 giras and 60 shekels will be equal to one mina. So he's given specifics. God's given specifics about what's acceptable what a leader is supposed to have, what they'll own, what they won't own. It says leaders don't get to own land. They're going to be solely relying upon the gifts and donations of the people. So he's telling them the specifics of how they're to operate in the house of God, if they're even to lead. This isn't just for the sheep. There are standards for leaders in God's house. So there are leaders that want to build their own house by a different measure other than how God builds a house, yet they keep demanding that the sheep stay aligned, hoping that they won't take notice of how their measures different from the leaders. How many of you notice that in your own walks? You've been let down. I'm not dogging leaders. I'm just shooting straight up. I'm a straight shooter. I put this Colt 45 back on my side. I'm not drawing in on you. I'm just telling you what he gave me today. So there aren't two different standards for the heart. There's just one. God doesn't say, you know, I'm going to do these things over here my way. And then you can go do your own, go play and let's meet up in the middle and we'll go have fun together. God's like, no, you align yourself with me or I'm not coming around. That's a deal breaker. And so for the obstinate leaders of the sheep, I'm going to say for both, there's obstinate leaders and sheep who want to make up their own rules as, that, as they go along for how they behave in God's house or how and who should, should keep God's standards. When he's trying to apply the standard all the way across the board and say, line your butt up. Get into alignment with me. So maybe we need to evaluate the log in our own eye before casting a stone at another sin. Because sheep and leaders that act like, let me see, act like they're not good people outwardly. Yet act like, or act like they are good people outwardly if they're in front of the public eye. But yet they act like hell behind the scenes because they think no one's looking. Our prime examples 
of the tomb of dead men's bones. They are dead men's bones, meaning nothing was reborn or came back to life when they proclaimed to be God's friend, when they proclaimed to know Christ. There was no rebirth. There was no born again. That means in our IE tear. So meaning, this is what God is saying by this before we go into first Peter is that I don't know about you, but for all my friends, for all my relationships, people that really love me, they don't just tolerate me. They celebrate me. Same with you. People that love you, they don't just tolerate you. They celebrate you, but they also hold you accountable. Okay. They hold us accountable. But none of my friends nor my acquaintances or true leaders that know how love behaves, they don't act and tolerate the dysfunction that many false sheep or false leaders are operating in. Love as a standard. And the Lord is saying it's time to raise your bar. It's time to raise your standard. And if you don't like the word today, then you need to go listen and go read your Bible about what God's saying in the book of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel, to me, is a really, it's like a tweaking book to me where it comes in and it's forcing alignment in so many different ways to get you back into alignment with God's times, dimension, realms, and seasons of the spirit. You've gotten thrown out of season because you refused to change or be changed in different seasons. A lot of it was because the enemy also knew how to throw you off because of generational cursings. So those are certain aspects of the things that were obstacles that held us back. But now that we know better, we're held accountable for it. We're, we're being held accountable by the Lord to uphold these new standards. And they're not new, by the way. They're, they're the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we're calling, God's calling us back to the basics to get us back into alignment with love. And there are certain things love never says, it never does, it never considers doing. And if you've done these things, then you need to go ask for forgiveness from the Lord and from the people you've done it to. And let the chips fall where they may. You may get the relationships back. You may not. I don't know. There are consequences for sin. But I believe that when we give the enemy a foothold, sometimes it takes time. So let's move into 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 as we're wrapping this up. We're talking about false teachers here. This is interesting how this is segueing into the entire conversation. It's just unrolling itself. And it's talking about believers who are scattered. Then it's also talking about grace. Okay, so first Peter says this letter comes from this letter is from Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living in a, living as foreigners in provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, Bithynia. Hope I'm saying that right. God, the father knew you and chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you've obeyed him. And have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They live in the middle of hostility. They have false teachers around them. So may God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy we've been born again. Are you really born again? I never thought I'd say that actually. People, but I guess it. It's the truth. I mean, I never actually thought that we'd actually be live, living in times where people were who were dealing with tears, but we're seeing so many people in pews beside us that they aren't being changed. They're not choosing to change. They're not choosing to be changed by a living spirit, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the salvation, this salvation, and we're going to fast forward to this, and I'm going to tell you my notes here. Um, the salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they were prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. So they went through something. They were going through something. They went through suffering. They were going through testings. They were The people were. The people were. They were going through testings. And so... False teachers, by the way, let's, let's go into this a little bit more. False teachers are those who don't correct dysfunctional hearts because they fear rocking the boat instead of making sure a heart is aligned with Christ. Salvation is a calling where the Father truly gives you new birth. And if you're not exhibiting change of new birth, chances are you're not born again. And if you're bucking a true teacher, trying to hold you accountable, chances are you don't think you need to change. Therefore, you think you're above Christ. 
on that leader. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. Let's move into Psalms 119.17-32, which is probably a good reason if you're thinking you know more than God. You know, God puts leaders into place. He puts people in place with specialized anointings for different regions, different people, different people groups, because he wants to instill and impart gifts. He wants to instill maturity. And he knows the specialized anointings on those leaders are going to bring about the type of change God is looking for, for that region. So when we're not willing to comply to God's house. We're not willing to comply to the rules of the house, the requirements. When we have no room and no right to gripe when we're not blessed or when chaos follows us. We don't have the right. So we need to be thanking God for those warm, loving, yet tough teachers who have the guts to call us out, who have the guts to call us out. I'm telling you, some of my hardest teachers, even in high school or even in college, the tough ones that just grilled you. Are you sure you believe that? Why do you believe that? They make you think about what you're thinking about. Why is that truth to you? And I mean, in college, they'd ask you, why is that truth to you? And you have to base it up, back it up with facts. Well, because the Bible says this, and I, I live, I try to live my rule of thumb based on the Bible. I try. I'm not a perfect person by any means, obviously. None of us are. But they don't let us, they don't let, let us live in an, an illusion or live in an illusion of truth about what we think is truth. They make us align to it. We align alongside of God if we're truly God's. So, and I'm still friends with these people today because they're the ones that held me accountable because I deeply respected them. I respect people that come and, and talk to me about things. I respect people that challenge me on things and and have dialogue to where we can like kind of, what do you say, filter or what do you say? We sift out the truth. You sift out the truth. So you just test back and forth and you let things unfold themselves sometimes where God shows people truth because there's nothing like revelation. So part of our testings within circumcision come with correction if we're truly wanting to advance forward. But if God sees something in you and he's pointing it out, if he sees something that needs to be course corrected, it's because he also sees something in you that he's trying to build up within him. So this is your roadmap forward. That's what he's trying to say. So fast forwarding is saying, this is what he's saying in uh, Psalms 119, 17 32. He's saying, don't be the know-it-all that's rebuked by the Lord because of the level of revelation that you're currently operating in keeps you stuck. Be course correctable and move on through. And the Lord says, above all, don't settle for a secondary version of love. Stay true to love. Stay true. A lot of the reason why a lot of the front runners right now have are where they're at for one is because you've paid a price to walk where you're at. But and so you've paid the price and walked through the testings to get what you've got. So all these people that are coming in behind you that want to tag lock and they want to that's what that's probably the wrong terminology that's what witches and satanists do they tag lock connects onto you because they like the anointing but people that want to ride on your coattails that's the word i'm looking for they want to ride on your coattails but they're not willing to go through what you've gone through to get what you've got are usually the wannabes and it's because they think there's a shortcut to getting there and there's not unfortunately there's only one way to the to the father and that's through jesus for one and if you're not willing to go through circumcision to get to the father so he can dwell over your house then he's not going to be abiding there so you can want all day long but he's not showing up and you won't have keys to his house nor does he want the keys to yours he can't dwell where sin is so they're saying i'm always overwhelmed with the desire for your regulations and then the, and the, the servant here is saying don't hide your commands from me i'm always overwhelmed with the desire for your regulations you rebuke the arrogant those who wander from your commands and they're cursed don't let them scorn and insult me, for I have obeyed your law. Even princes sit and speak against me, but I'll meditate on your decrees, Lord. I'm not going to settle for seconds. So even if it costs you something, if it costs you relationships, I'm not settling for seconds. You shouldn't settle for seconds. Don't ever settle for a secondary version of love. Stay true. Stay true to the warm, unconditional love of Christ. This is, I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. I told you my plans, and you answered now teach me your decrees. Help me understand the meaning of your commandments. 
and I'll meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Keep me from lying to myself. Let me repeat that. Keep me from lying to myself and give me the privilege of knowing your instruction. Do you lie to yourself? Do you lie to yourself about things about yourself? You think, oh, it's not that bad. I'm not that bad. Yet you're still staying the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing around you is changing. When God's been putting his finger on things in your heart, things on your life, where he's been demanding change. Are you lying to yourself? Do you lie to yourself a lot? Do you just dismiss it and say, yeah, that's not God. That's not God. And then you have friends at church come up alongside of you and they'll bring it up. They'll get, hey, God told me to give you the scripture. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's not God. Well, you'll get in your quiet time and that's the first thing that pops up at you is that same scripture. <gasps> so God's like, you know, it's time to be honest with yourself. If you want change, then you got to follow through and you got to follow God's ways. So we're going to move on into Proverbs 28, 8 through 10 while we're wrapping up. We're at 51 minutes right now. I told you God, I'd go a little bit over, but it says income from charging high interest rates will end up in the pocket of someone who is kind to the poor. Where it's like, be generous. That's a part of my spirit. Second part, God detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law. Those who lead good people along an evil path, false teachers, will fall into their own trap. But the honest will inherit good things. Are you encouraged today? I'm encouraged and I want you to be encouraged because I feel like God's got a great plan for you. And even though you may not understand it right here, right now, the prophets have told you that God is turning the ship around. So he doesn't want you to give up and jump ship yet. Don't jump ship before you get to your destination. Was it Jonah that wanted to do that? Wasn't that jo Don't be a Jonah. Don't be a Jonah. Stay the course. Stay the course and do what God's calling you to do because you're almost there. Don't get stuck in your emotions this holiday season. Don't be looking at what you see with your eyes because your eyes will fail you. Don't, get, don't let your emotions lead you. Cast them down, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, and step back up in love. Step back up in faith. Your feelings have nothing to do with your faith. Remember that, okay? But if you're encouraged today, if you're on YouTube watching the replay, you've got a subscribe button in your no upper right-hand corner. And if you hit subscribe, you can subscribe and watch the replays once we post them. Um, and if you want to join Ezekiel's Wheel because you like what you hear, pardon me, you can email me at memoirs of an ADHD mind at gmail.com. We'd love to have you. We do vet and we do. We'd love to onboard you and teach you. We get you free. Uh, we try to do our best to get you where God wants you to be. So definitely consider that if you feel led to be here. If you want to support the ministry, definitely hit the PayPal button above and you can subscribe and uh, definitely donate there. And so we, we appreciate everything that you do. Uh, we want you guys to have a happy holiday season, guys. Don't let the enemy steal your joy this holiday season. We have a lot to be grateful for. We've got holidays, uh, the holiday season coming up this next month with, or actually this week with Thanksgiving and then next month with Christmas. And so the joy of the Lord is our strength. Stay in joy. Stay in joy, guys. Isaiah 40, 30, 31, that those that wait upon the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles, will run and not grow weary, will walk and not grow faint, even during the testing seasons even when he's circumcising us, and even when we think the tests are never going to come to an end. He's in the middle of the test, and every test has an ending day. Know that I love you. I'll be catching you back on Monday. I'll be posting a 15-minute rev, or I'm doing the live actually for you on Monday, and so I'll look forward to seeing you then, guys. And until then, have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll be looking for you. Bye-bye.